We'd like to welcome you to our current event and weekly Bible study for May 17th, 2009. And today we're going to be continuing the study on Disney. I didn't realize it was going to go this long, but this is a very deep study. And um, regarding being able to cover all the bases, uh, we're probably going to have at least two, probably another two or three parts to this. And, uh, and then we'll wrap it up. Continuing where we left off from last week, with the report that I was reading from regarding Disney, it starts off by saying the entire world system pulled together to ensure that Disneyland got the image and the publicity that the top Illuminati families and the various syndicates wanted it to have. So again, realize that this is a a priority for the top 13 Illuminati families and the world government. This is Disney, the more I, I research the study is just a one of the many, but one of the more mightier tools in Satan's hands to bring us in to the New World Order, to the One World Government, to the One World Religious System. It is just a tool for that. And so this is something that the Illuminati families, the highest up, and Satan himself have been very much behind. And that's why this is an important subject. Because it's it's people are so deceived, thinking that it's something wholesome and good, when in reality it's something evil and corrupt. And the Bible talks about woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, and light for darkness and darkness for light. That's what you're doing when you call Disney something good. So it's, it's something that you don't want to uh, don't want to do. They've uh, It says, when something that everyone thinks is clean and wholesome is not attacked by the world system, that should raise eyebrows among thinking people. I mean, think about it. Something clean and wholesome, if it really was that, why isn't it being attacked by the world system? Something truly clean and wholesome um, in today's day and world age will be attacked if it truly is that by various parts of the world system. Going further, it says homeschooling, learning to read phonetically, and other wholesome activities for children have been viciously attacked and ridiculed by the established media. Why has Disney gone untouched? Disney Studios, for years, strove to have a very clean image. Workers had dress codes. Any activity on the part of the employees that wasn't morally conservative was grounds for instant dismissal. Now, of course, the exceptions were all covered up, such as the employee who used hypnosis to get a few of the female employees at Disney to undress until they were actually nude. John L. Hulting, the author of The Messenger Motives, and he gives all the page number and everything here, he informs us, quote, as communication researchers have emphasized, the greatest impact the media have on the formation or change of public opinion is in the terms of the impressions built upon over long periods of time. In other words, they just keep hammering you and hammering you and hammering you repetitively with the media on the message they want to convey to you. And at first, the the message may seem ludicrous, but after you've had it hammered into your head over 10 or 20 years, then all of a sudden, it's just somewhere along the line, it's accepted as fact and true without you questioning it anymore, because you've been brainwashed. Uh, Going further, it says, The wholesomeness of Disney is an image that has been built over a long period of time. Disney's occult themes of world citizenship, world citizenship, again, what is that about? That's about becoming one world government, one world political system, one world religious, one world currency. Are you going to be a good global citizen for Satan, for the Antichrist? Because you need to fall in line. And this is a tool they're using. So, Disney's occult themes of world citizenship, witchcraft, humanism, and idolatry have also been long-running impressions that have been craftily perpetuated upon this nation. People don't associate movies like, um, it's called Consenting Adults with Disney, or or the movie called The Corpse Had a Familiar Face with Disney. In fact, as previously mentioned, when Disney wanted to put out more, quote, adult films, they did with a sleight of hand and created a label, Touchstone Films, so that the people wouldn't associate movies like Splash with Disney's productions. Another label, Hollywood Pictures, was created by Disney to help distribute these Touchstone films. 
<clears throat> let's see here. Going further, it says from the time of its opening until October 12, 1995, Disney's Disney World calculated a half a billion people had visited there. Half a billion. Now, there's only, uh, at the time, it would be about six billion on the planet. So they had had literally a twelfth of the whole world's, at least number-wise, visit there. I know a lot of them were repeat visitors. But a twelfth of the total world population they had had through their... their uh, and that's just Disney World. Disney World's the one that's in Orlando. Who knows if you added them all up? Half a billion people. <clears throat> the amusement park, now this is Disney World, is in Orlando, Florida, on over 27,400 acres, and includes Epcot Center, which is now simply called Epcot. The Epcot Center was another dream of Walt Disney's. Epcot originally stood, now listen to this, Epcot, the, 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 the uh, symbols originally stood for experimental prototype community of tomorrow. Experimental prototype community of tomorrow. Kind of sounds like what I reported on not too long ago on that Venus project. The U, basically, the United Nations sponsored Venus project that's in Venus, Florida here. That I went and I told you I went up to their front gates and I prayed. It's out in the middle of the the, the woods in Venus, Florida, which is a remote area as it is. And praise the Lord, <clears throat> within our two or three months, they put it up for sale. It's been up for sale. I don't know if they sold it or not. I haven't checked. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to say, you know, I'm Mr. Whatever. But fact remains is that we did go out there and pray, Taylor and I, at the uh, front gates, and within two to three months, I don't, I don't even think it was two months. That was up for sale, and this is the big. This was the big prototype for this one world, uh, a community, for this Venus project. Which you know, um, it's basically Mother Gaia, sustainable uh, development, um, tree hugger deluxe, one world antichrist type of system that they're wanting to pattern the world after. <clears throat> they also have a uh, out in Venus, which is an occult name, um, they have a, a gay, uh, it's like a campground, where, you know, the, the, the queers and the gays and the lesbians can go out there and frolic in the, in the woods and not have anybody bother them. It's called, now guess what that's called, Camp Mars. So again, we have Mars, which is the planet, the red planet, the god of war, which is what Mars is associated with, and Venus, uh, which is... You know, we could do a whole study just on that word alone. And there probably, as the crow flies, within about maybe a mile or a mile and a half of one another, this Camp Mars and this uh, Venus project, it's kind of a weird thing, you know. Went up to their front gates, too, and prayed against that. Uh, abomination. But it's funny how sin will attract sin. Sin begets sin. And if you have this... There's some, there's some occult significance with this land out there, and I think it has a lot to do with the name of it. But anyway, just a, as a side note, I wanted to mention that. So Epcot was originally stood for Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. It was an extension of the massive mind control being carried out at Disney World. The original Epcot city was designed by Walt was to carry on its commerce and traffic via underground roads and tunnels like the Disney theme parks. After Walt Disney died, his successors changed the proposed experimental city into another theme park simply called Epcot. So it didn't turn out like Walt wanted it to. He literally wanted it to be like this Venus project. Okay? Did it, but I think what they saw is maybe the world wasn't quite ready for that yet, and or they're going to have a harder time bringing people in just with that concept alone. They, wouldn't, they needed to spice it up. So it ended up becoming Epcot where they had... You know, one part was, like, France, and another part was Germany, or whatever they they did. I was there one time as a, I don't know how old I was. Probably 13 or 14, I think I went there. But I don't remember a lot about Epcot for some reason. Um, anyway, going further. In reality, many visitors to Disney World began the day 
enthusiastic and after a day of the hot sun and waiting in long lines with large crowds for imitation reality, the tourists are zombie-like and looking forward to getting back to their hotels. Now, this is another thing that I hadn't really thought of. But when you go to these theme parks, whether Disney World or whatever, and a lot of times, if you're in Florida, you end up going during the summer because that's the only thing. Your, your, your children are off from school. It's a summer break. And um, it's not as crowded as it is in the winter. But summers in Florida are brutal. And you're out there in the hot sun waiting for an hour, an hour and a half to get on some stinking ride was what it boils down to. And it's just, it's just um, I think it's all part of the whole whatever mental effect they're trying to instill in people. He calls it tourists are zombie-like and looking forward to getting back to the hotels. Um, it's just something else to kind of think about there. Some of the spooky events like Snow White's Adventures or the oversized heads of the Disney characters walking around can leave the little preschool children terrified in days for the rest of the day. In contrast, older children, who normally or rarely show patience at home, may show how much they do want to go on a particular Disney ride by waiting an hour and a half in the hot sun for a ride. This um, ride alien counter is a Walt Disneyland feature that invites tourists in for a, quote, demonstration of interplanetary teleportation. Now, what that means is, is you are... um, you know how, like on Star Trek, they used to have they would go to the teleporter room and they would they would you'd get in the little things and they would teleport your body via the molecules down to the planet surface. Well, they've got evidently some way of simulating what they call interplanetary teleportation. Now, if you go on shows that are that are very prevalent on TV right now, there's a heavy emphasis on what they call stargates. Uh, sometimes they're called wormholes. And what these are is they're essentially like an interplanetary teleportation device. It's it's a it's a um, it's kind of like a hole through our universe that you can go through, and you can literally be on the other side in a matter of seconds. It's it's a way that you could divert, traverse large, huge distances just through this. Now, the one thing I'll have to say is that. If there was no truth to any of this whatsoever, why would Hollywood be so obsessed about shoving this down our throats? And there's whole shows that are devoted to this. Stargate Atlantis, Stargate SGI. Uh, There's other shows that have emphasized this. Witches and warlocks and people that are heavily involved in the occult are obsessed with these things. They call them many times the same things. Stargates, or many times they're referred to as portals. Now, some of these are purely, because I I did a lot of extra research on this. I've never done a study on this, but I've done a lot of research on this. They'll go to these places that have special occult significance. Typically where human sacrifice has been committed, or maybe it's where these things called ley lines cross. Some plots of land with uh, significant, significant occult, uh, and they believe that what they can do is at these plots of land, they can actually summon what they term to be good entities through these dimensional doorways. Now, I believe there's absolute truth in that, because the occultists are, number one, obsessed with it. Aleister Crowley was obsessed with it. One of his main goals was uh, to try to invoke uh, through it was called the alarm trough working. Aleister Crowley, the great beast, uh, we mentioned him many, many times. We're going to mention him even more today. He would actually invite these entities through. And how did he do that? He had to do it through high level witchcraft, uh, usually where all kind of vile acts are being committed, maybe child sacrifice, human sacrifice. It allows these interdimensional doorways to be opened. That's what happens. High-level occultists are obsessed with this. After Aleister Crowley died, L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology and 
Parsons. His last name was Parsons. He, he owned uh, Jet Propulsion's laboratory. They did their own working to invoke a high-level devil through one of these portals called the Babylonian working, where they were trying to invite the whore of Babylon to literally come and to walk on our planet. Now, I'm telling you that witchcraft, particularly at high levels, there's validity to it. I'm not saying it's good, but people, these, these high-level witches would not go through all these things. Sometimes these ceremonial witchcraft uh, things can take weeks to perform. They're not going through this because there's no benefit. Maybe either to them or a perceived benefit. As, as maybe they think they gain more power, they do this or that. You know, they're demon-possessed. They're inspired of Satan to do these things. So it's hard to understand exactly what their motivation is. But when Aleister Crowley did his, the Elamtrop working, he invoked this thing that walked through the portal, and its name was Lom, and it looked just, or very, very similar to the modern-day gray aliens that we have, which is what, which is actually when we really started seeing the advent of a lot of the gray aliens after that. Okay, they're demonic um, creatures. I just bring that up because it does relate to this, okay? And this Alien Encounters ride is, is, is where they're actually looking for a demonstration of interplanetary teleportation. They're conditioning the masses to be able to accept this type, whether it's actually your physical body being teleported or whether it's actually devils, demons, these angels of light that appear, they're actually angels of darkness, but they appear as angels of light. The Bible says that if, a, if Satan himself can be transformed into an angel of light, it's no marvel that his ministers can be transformed into ministers of righteousness. Devils and demons will typically appear in order to deceive you to the maximum as an angel of light. They're not going to appear typically with, you know, horns and a, fit, a pitchfork and a forked tail and a forked tongue with cloven hooves. That's going to scare people. So, again, this is just one other thing I kind of wanted to touch on. Going back to this ride, it says, when the demonstration as planned breaks down, okay, so this, so this demonstration on interplanetary teleportation, all of a sudden it breaks down, supposedly, as part of the ride, okay? And an alien with a, a show... Um, Associated traits appears among the audience and terrorizes the audience. The cute creature is hideously fried, deformed, and then vomited into space screaming. This is what happens during this alien encounter ride that you're at at Disney uh, Disneyland, I believe. Here are some comments from visitors to Walt Disneyland about this ride. This is from a a woman from Missouri, and she said, Alien Encounter is one of those rides I can say I've seen and that I have no intention of ever doing again. In fact, parents who take children under the age of six should be brought up on child abuse. End of quote. That's how nasty this ride is. But hey, it's good wholesome fun for the kiddies. Here's another one. Alien Encounter, this is from a mother in Phillipsburg, New Jersey. Alien Encounter was the worst experience for my ten-year-old and almost every child in there. It starts out cute enough during the pre-show, but the actual show is a disaster for children. My daughter screamed and cried in terror throughout it. She's ten years old. I mean, it's not like she's four. I thought the Disney warnings were vague and inaccurate. When we left, there wasn't one child with dry eyes. Even sturdy-looking 12-year-old boys were crying. I think an age requirement of 13 to 14 is more appropriate. I talked to a few adults, and we even agreed that the special effects were extremely unpleasant, even for us. This is not a Disney family experience. It is atrocious. End of quote. Oh, well, no. It is a Disney family experience. That's the problem that people are not understanding here. They understood what we're reporting in this report. It's absolutely in line with a Disney family experience. Here's another quote from a family in Laurel, Maryland. They say, quote, we did go to the alien encounter. The pre-show is deceiving. It kind of lulls you into thinking it isn't so bad. When the main part came up, I admit the experience gave me the absolute heebie-jeebies. I am never doing that presentation again. 
It was way too intense for me, and I'm 27 years, 27 years old. Now, Michael Eisner, the president, current president of Walt Disney, initially rejected Alien Counter for not being scary enough. When it was being actually considered adding, uh, added to Disney World, one wonders what he would have, what he would have actually liked, you know, in order to qualify. Snow White's Adventure, which was an attraction at Disneyland, was one of what the Disney people called the dark rides. After a, after a while, a sign appeared. Now, this is on the, the um, Snow White's Adventures. Now, I mean, it sounds innocent enough, right? After a while, a sign appears with a witch who was warning people that the attraction was scary. Later, in 1983, they renamed it Snow White's Scary Adventures. It might be interesting to point out that the original Snow White and Seven Dwarfs film came out that England forbid the film to be seen by any child under 16 unless accompanied by an adult because of the scary content of the movie. How far we've come since then. Um, let's see here. Schools in Florida and California areas also make field trips to, mag- to the Magic Kingdom that are arranged with Disney. Epcot receives tens of thousands of children this way during March, September, and October. High schools use the Magic Kingdom for proms and senior nights. And some couples use the facilities of the Magic Kingdom for weddings. Now, before I go any further, I went there, uh, boy, I believe I was probably out of college. Or not, no, I was just going into college, out of high school. And I went there with a friend of mine. His name was Sean Guffey. I remember this. And we went to this thing. Now, he was, you know, he was the typical Christian. I was not a Christian. I was a heathen. Okay? I was not brought up in any kind of Christian household whatsoever. But he, his family had this veneer and this facade of, of Christianity. And they, they went to a Baptist church, and he sang in the choir. The, the, he was what the world would term today as a dog. I mean, this guy was just, he was something else. And I had no problem with him because that's, you know, I wasn't quite as bad as him, but he was pretty bad, particularly when it came to women. And he went up every year to this thing they had at Disney called the Night of Joy. And it was supposedly this Christian thing you went up to where they had Christian rock bands and this, and and it was all Christian stuff, and it was all good, clean, wholesome fun. And I'm pretty sure the only reason we had went up there is to see if we could find, you know, whatever, whatever, uh, a girl or something. We we didn't, thank God. But, you know, it's just typical. I guess I say that to just say it's typical of the type of um, things that are attracted to Disney. I mean, they've got all these worldly things going on. And, you know, senior nights, prom nights... All kind of high schools coming in there. And the place is pure evil. And it's a brainwashing center, is really what it boils down to. And people can go there. Even the gays can go there now, because they have their gay day. And we're going to talk about that more later. We've already talked about it some. But even the gays can go there and have, have a facade of, of wholesomeness. And, and, and it adds legitimacy to what they're doing as a movement because, hey, I've got Disney's endorsement on my lifestyle now. So you you understand how how what Disney's done is empowered a lot of wickedness, put a wholesome veneer or the stamp of approval on it. It's it's pure evil. Now, Modern Bride, which is the magazine, ranked Orlando as the number one honeymoon destination in the world. Personally, I can't even stand going up to Orlando anymore. I live in Southwest Florida. I don't don't like going up to Orlando. Everything's fake. Disney World being the crowning example. But everything is fake. The only time I go up there now is if I have, um, like, continuing education things you have to have to be a doctor. I'll go up there if there's a seminar or something like that, if I have to. I don't like going up there, but... It's just, it's the most fake place that I've ever been in my life. It really is. Everything up there is, 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 
you know, just geared toward this fantasy land. Everything is, well, right now the hotels aren't overpriced because the economy is so bad, but you go up there any other time, everything, uh, the theme parks are totally overpriced. Er everything is, is insanely expensive. And most of the time, if you go up there and do any type of activity, you're just giving money back to Satan, is what it really boils down to. So, I mean, Anheuser-Busch owns SeaWorld, uh, which would take care of, uh, you know, Busch Gardens, SeaWorld, then you have Disney World, which owns all types of things up there. It's just that no matter what you do, if you go up there, you're not going to have any kind of godly vacation. There's no way. I, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't take my daughter on those types of things anymore. I, maybe at one time, a long time ago, I might have, but not anymore. I just don't want to feed into that system, and I'm afraid God would what He would do to me if I did. <laughs> so anyway, going further. So Modern Bride ranked Orlando as the number one honeymoon destination in the world. Group discussions of people who took honeymoons to Disney World have have had a consensus that the hype is not as great as the reality. Some weddings are done with cartoon characters. Sounds biblical. Uh, Disney offers the fairy tale wedding packages. Fairy. You know, like the little fairy, which is absolutely nothing more than a little devil, demonic imp type thing. Yeah. So you can have your fairy tale wedding packages. A great deal for two mind control slaves. They can reinforce the programming while getting married. The Disney fairy tale wedding typically has, it, has its ceremony on a pavilion on an island in the Seven Seas Lagoon with the Cinderella Castle in the backdrop. The fairy tale wedding can then be followed with a fantasy reception and a choice of themes such as Beauty and the Beast or Aladdin. Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin. Pure witchcraft. Both movies. Beauty and the Beast. Wasn't that guy like basically a shapeshifter? The beast guy, he wasn't, he got turned back into, it was all witchcraft. Aladdin, what is that? It's about a genie in a bottle, which is also known as a djinn. That's why they call him genies, djinn. The other day, um, there was, um, there's two shows on, there were, there were two shows on back to back. And I just showed Taylor real quick. I said, see this? I dream of genie and bewitched. Two of the shows they had back in the 70s. And I think even in the 60s, possibly with, my, with uh, I Dream of Genie, late 60s, where you were totally being conditioned to witchcraft. You have a genie in a bottle that grants you three wishes. Oh, she's this wonderful, you know, pretty seductively dressed genie in a bottle. And it was pure, purely, just like Walt Disney, getting us conditioned to witchcraft and evil, to accept it as something good. It was all innocent, good, you know, oh, it's so cute, it's innocent, it's pure witchcraft. You're bringing a curse on yourself when you embrace these types of shows. Bewitched. No different. Now, that one was even more overt because she was a witch and her family were all witches. And they portrayed their husband, Darren, as this idiot fool. And that's how he was portraying the thing. And, and the witches were the ones that were shown that had all the real power. Just like in I Dream of Genie, she had all the power. Witchcraft. It's so overt. If, if I watch... Parts of it now, I'm just amazed, because as a little child, I didn't think anything of it. But now it's so overt to me to watch those and see the absolute, total, flagrant programming. And again, look, making it, oh, this is white witchcraft, we do good, and, when we, and whenever possible, I don't use my powers. I try to be like a mortal. Because, see, they, they view themselves as not mortal on Bewitched. They were, I don't know if they called themselves immortal. There's a big time curse associated with Bewitched. The Darren, the husband, you notice, I don't know if you ever remember that show, but the second, the, the reason the first husband had to go is because he had all these horrific things happen to him. And the second one, pretty much the same thing ended up happening. I've seen, the, I've seen that before. But, you know, and I'm not saying go and, 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 you know, watch these shows, but to actually have a little refresher on it, it, I was just, it just blows my mind to watch this stuff uh, for just even a little bit, just to see the overtness. But you, you can have your choice of themes in these fantasy weddings as Beauty and the Beast or Aladdin. Pure total witchcraft. 
Cinderella. There's so much witchcraft in every single aspect of Disney, it, it, you just, there's no way we could get into it all. So the fantasy programming can then continue as the bride is delivered to Cinderella's Ball by an artificial glass carriage drawn by six white Disney ponies. A costume fairy godmother and stepsisters are also at the ball. Now, in that show, I'm pretty sure, what did they, ch- didn't they, like, change, like, things into, like, uh, didn't they change the carriage from, like, was it, like, a pumpkin or something, or? It was witchcraft, though, is what I'm trying to say, is, is how she got all of her stuff, where she ended up looking beautiful and perfect. It was all pure witchcraft that got her there, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Yeah, see, I, it's been a long time, long time since I've seen that, but Taylor just refreshed my memory that, yes, they, the, one, the lady, when they transformed Cinderella into what she ended up becoming, it was through witchcraft. She had, like, this little magic wand, and she tapped her, and her clothes changed to rags to this wonderful bride gown, and, and then I know they did the same thing with the carriage and then the horses, and it was pure witchcraft. Overt. But because it's done under the white witchcraft veneer, okay, we're, we're using good witchcraft to do good things against the evil stepsisters, well, then it's okay. See, the devil is the most subtle beast of the field, according to Genesis 3. He's the most subtle beast of the field. This is... Although now it seems overt, at the time it was very subtle as a child watching these things, because I didn't know any better, and nobody ever told me, and I don't think the churches were really crying out against this. Even at the time, I don't think they were. When a lot of this stuff was coming into being, I do not believe the churches were crying out against this, as they're not doing today as well. Maybe some, I'm sure some were, but most weren't. So, um, and then the costume fairy godmother and stepsisters are also at the ball. Dessert is actually served in a white chocolate slipper to complete the whole motif and effect. So, in the 1990s, the Illuminati controlled companies continued their promotion of Disney. For instance, the Nestle's family, Nestle, um, you know, Nestle Chocolate. They promote, they promote Disney movies on their chocolate bars. The Nestle family is exposed in this author's booklet of Illuminati, um, the Illuminati control over foods and grains. And don't think they don't control the world food supply. They do. It's just one of the many aspects that, um, you know, I, I just, I can't, there's so many subjects and topics to cover, I just can't cover them all. I mean, I, I wish I would have started this when I first knew about Sermon Audio, like maybe three years earlier, because I could have probably most of everything that we could have covered, but the Lord has a reason for everything. Um, but the Nestle, is, Nestle family is actually listed in, as one of the elite black nobility families. doesn't mean they're, they're black, as far as black and white, but it's called black nobility. In 1996, Walt Disney's World... Walt Disney World created an actual residential town named Celebration on its property. This was a self-contained community and has 20,000 people and a school, and who knows how many now, a school and a theater, a fiber optic information network linking business as well as other features. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about this a little bit later. But this is a, um, this is like Big Brother Celebration in Orlando. Okay, um, it's kind of like what Walt Disney was originally um, imagining with Epcot and like the Venus Project. It's like they were taking it one step further into a real community. And we're going to talk about it. it. It's a creepy place. Seriously creepy. Now, nearly all of Disney's 1920 movies had a black cat in them, which is also, you know, you associate black cats and witches on broomsticks and things like this. And there's a reason for that. You know, many had occult slants to their scripts. The occult slant never departed from the Disney themes. Now, these are some of the movies that Disney, that had blatant occult themes over the years. One was Aladdin, 
We already talked about that one. What's a wise, cracking, all-powerful genie, or what occultically is known as a jinn, he was shown. I saw a thing on that the other day, where they're actually taking what the genie was saying to the guy. He was offering him the world. It was just like Satan. No different. And they were and they were showing all these musical themes where the genie was dancing, had all these devils around him dancing, and he had all these harem girls that were created because the genie was creating them. And he was offering Aladdin all of these things. It was, and it's just like the devil offering you the world. You know? Just give me your soul, and I'll, I'll give you this in exchange. And it was this clip after clip after clip I was watching of these movies that were doing that. Aladdin, in this particular instant. Uh, we're talking just blatant, blatant flagrant witchcraft. And then th- there was a movie called Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. That was from 1971. Uh, like a broomstick a witch rides on. This is a show where a witch finds a magic formula from a Lion King. Kind of weird because then they had the Lion King itself, which is also based on a lot, on a lot of occult themes, the Lion King. We talked about that a little bit as well. This magic formula raises a ghostly armor army of armor in a museum which stops a band of German commandos. So, in other words, they're using witchcraft to raise this ghostly army of armor to stop this band of German commandos. So they're using witchcraft in order to, to supposedly do good. Because in Walt Disney's movies, the ends always justify the means. The end always justifies the means. So then there's another one, Beyond Witch Mountain, which was made in 1982, which a pair of twins leave Witch's Mountain and have to use their special occult powers to outwit a character named Durinian. Now, then there was Escape from Witch Mountain with Jodie Foster, who I'm convinced was a mind control slave. She's now a lesbian. She's made all kind of occult movies. Uh, really, movies that have, <coughs> excuse me, occult themes. And then we just had the new Witch Mountain one, which was, what was that one called? Race, Race to Witch Mountain? It just came out. That was all the, the rage in the theaters. So they're still, you know, they're still... What's that about? You know, that was about aliens. Good aliens, though. And witchcraft. And Do you see the unbelievable... Okay, sorry about that. Um, but just... Just to look at the unbelievable amount of brainwashing and occult themes and witchcraft themes and alien themes that Disney has, you know, portrayed through these movies. Flagrant. What other institution could have got away with this? There is none. I don't think there's another institution that could have got away with this or is as cleverly crafted as Disney has been crafted by its master, Satan. <clears throat> another movie, 1985, was called The Black Cauldron. You know, like a cauldron, the witches brew, what they brew up their spell stuff in. In this movie, a horned king uses his magic to fight a clairvoyant pig and the pig's keeper. This animation cost $25 million, was a box office failure. Well, oh, praise God. <clears throat> then there was the Bride of Bojidi. This is a 1987. In this movie, an evil spirit visits the Davis family and puts the father under a spell. Sounds like good, clean, fun family entertainment to me. Here's another one, 1978, Child of Glass. A glass doll must be found to set a ghost free in a haunted house. These are Disney movies, just typical examples. Now, I'm not even going over the current ones. I, I, again, this report is a little bit dated, but you're going to get the point here. We're going to cover a little bit more modern stuff at the very end of this report, like Hannah Montana and that type of garbage. And then there was another one in May 1967 called The Gnome Mobile in which a multimillionaire and grandchildren encounter gnomes. In the end, the multimillionaire deeds the forest to the gnomes for eternity. Well, the, the problem with that, Mr. Millionaire, is the Bible says that the, is that the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, and all they that dwell therein. 
All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And that's Jesus Christ they're talking about in John 1. Gnomes, just like fairies and all these other little what they call elementals, fairies, pixies, mermaids, all this garbage, they're all demonic creatures. And there is some basis in fact for every one of them because these are most likely spiritual <clears throat> creatures that can manifest in a, in a bodily way. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't think Satan wants me talking about this. Going these coughing fits here all of a sudden for no apparent reason whatsoever. <clears throat> I like talking about this type of stuff because we're exposing evil. A lot of people don't think, oh, there's nothing wrong with a gnome. I mean, don't, don't, they have the uh, new Travelocity commercials now. They have a gnome as their main... <clears throat> what? Yeah, it is a gnome. It's a... Oh, well, anyway. Um, but, yeah, gnomes are, gnomes are nothing more. Like, leprechauns, gnomes, all, they're all demonic. Every single bit of it. Satan claws, gnomes, Ishtar bun, all of this stuff is based... Upon the occult, these are devils and demons that can manifest and transform themselves in different ways. Gnomes are no different. It's all evil. Trolls. Whatever. Ogres. <clears throat> They're not cute. They're not good. They're pure evil. Okay? Peter Pan. Another great example. Witchcraft, pure witchcraft with, you know, Tinkerbell. It, it, it's all witchcraft, every bit of it. So, see, Harry Potter was just the natural progression. Twilight series was just the natural progression of what Disney started. <clears throat> and then the, another movie made in 1977 by Disney, Halloween Hall of Fame. Which, which is a movie where jack-o'-lanterns come to life. Now, we've done a whole teaching on Halloween. You can access that to see the unbelievably horrific, brutal, satanic roots behind Halloween. And then, in 1982, they made the movie Halloween Treat. Now, if Disney was so good and wholesome, why would they be promoting Halloween? It should be called Halloween. It's the darkest, most wicked night of the year. It's essentially considered Lucifer's birthday. It's a high night of human sacrifice. In fact, it's the highest night of human sacrifice on the occult calendar. <clears throat> so this Halloween treat movie was made in 1982. It was about a movie where cartoons about Halloween. This was followed the next year with a film, Haunted Halloween, which talked about the origins of Halloween. Oh, I'm sure you got a real whitewashed version on that. I'll tell you about the real origins of Halloween and the Wicker Man. I access my my teaching on my homepage on Sermon Audio. Just go to if you, if you um you can go to sermonaudio.com and click under the um, speakers and I'll be under Scott A Johnson because there's two Scott Johnsons. Uh, and that'll get you there. <clears throat> and then you can go up on my search box on my homepage and just key in part of the word Halloween or any subject that you're looking for on the homepage, and it'll take you there. <clears throat> Another show, Misadventures of Merlin Jones. This was made in 1964. This is where a genius tries to help other students. He tries to also use hypnotism and ESP, which backfire on him. <clears throat> and then another movie, The Richest Cat in the World, uh, which was made in 1986. A wealthy man leaves his fortune to his cat, whose relatives later discover can talk. So now we've got a cat that can actually um, talk, which would be totally, you know, evil, witchcraft type of, type of stuff. But see, it's all put with this wonderful little veneer on it that makes it more palatable. <clears throat> now, when this author spoke to former Illuminati mind control slaves about Disney, their reaction was that Disney had been described to them when they were in the Illuminati, as a, quote, syndicate within a syndicate. These are people that have been brainwashed within Disney in its tunnels and <clears throat> underground cities and stuff, which, I, which we went over in previous teachings here. They said that while the Illuminati 
while they were in the Illuminati, they were aware that Disneyland had their own government, their own rules, and their own police force. They were a crime syndicate within a syndicate. This is what the Illuminati alters casually mentioned, and was verified by this author the hard way through research. <clears throat> One Disneyland security supervisor said, quote, there is no constitution at Disneyland. We have our own laws, end of quote. If Disneyland guards decide to, they can get uh, rough physically with people, assault them in any fashion they see fit. The people they detain are often thrown into tiny cells at Disneyland where they are kept without the benefit of a phone call, without the benefit of a toilet or water. The, ju the judicial system turns a blind eye to whatever the Disney police do. Many people pay Disney to get their children out of a Disney jail cell, and they never get any due process of law as well. <clears throat> Recently, when a couple filed a wrongful death suit against the Magic Kingdom of Disney World in Florida, the state of Florida surprisingly had appeared to have backed off from their traditional behavior of protecting Disney's sovereignty. An attorney in the case said, quote, <clears throat> Disney World security people aren't just cops. They are bad ones. I don't think there is any corpor corporation that has ever had this kind of perceived power that Disney has. That was the end of the quote. Richard Fogelsong, a professor of politics at Rollins College in Winter Park, stated, <clears throat> quote, Because Disney World controls so much of its corporate and municipal universe, it can't help but act in a heavy-handed manner in order to ferociously protest protect its self-interest. They have immunity from state and local laws of the land. They can build a nuclear plant, distribute alcohol. They have powers local communities do not have. Do they abuse it? In my opinion, yes. <clears throat> and again, that was that quote from that professor of politics. <clears throat> In line with Disney's previous dictatorial policies on their properties, Disney's new city called Celebration will not have any elected government. Now, we're going to talk about Celebration now. You go right by Celebration uh, on your way up I-4 toward Disney. I believe it's on the left-hand side. Now, I've already heard horse stories about the Celebration. I'm pretty sure I knew somebody that lived there, and they said it was like... And I can't totally recall the story, but this totally confirms what they told me. That it, it was beyond Big Brother. I mean, you want a little taste of the New World Order, you want a taste of the One World Government that's coming, go, move to, move to Orlando, Florida, to Celebration, if you can get in there. And live there. And you'll, you'll kind of understand what it's going to be like. It's kind of like the Venus Project that we talked about already, you know, come to fruition. Since the city is unincorporated, and if you want to know more about the Venus Project, just click in Venus in my search box on my homepage, and it'll take you to that teaching where I talked about that. <clears throat> and how that ties in with the United Nations and Lord Maitreya and the whole nine yards. Since the city is unincorporated, the celebration, <clears throat> which was a, a neat Disney trick that he says here, the city is actually unincorporated. The mayor is appointed by Disney. Several Disney quasi-governmental bodies control citizens of the city. For instance, the Celebration Residential Owners Association, which participates in binding all residents to a Declaration of Covenants, which is a legal binder of rules that residents must live by. Of course, the Declaration of Covenants was written by Disney. These rules include such nitpicky things as no more than two people can sleep in the same bedroom, no pickup trucks can be parked in front of the homes, and if Disney officials don't like your dog or cat, they can forcibly remove them, the animal, from your home. Disney Corporation has perpetuated numerous deceptions on residents, including shoddy work on their homes and operating their public, quote, public school system with Disney cronies. Still, the residents that have moved into celebration are glowing with praise for the town in spite of the fact that the city is totally run by the Big Brother Disney Corporation. Of course, those who don't love it soon leave. And this is what, I think it was a lady that I talked to. They were out of, they didn't stay very long. I mean, it's creepy. But anyway, I thought that was interesting, because they've already got their own little prototype right on their own, you know, at Disney. You, you, want, to, you want to taste the Big Brother? Well, celebrations will give you a ladle full. <clears throat> Going further, 
Just prior to World War II, the FBI recruited Walt Disney. This is part of this report from Fritz Springmeier. <clears throat> so prior to World War II, the FBI actually recruited Walt Disney. His job was to spy on Hollywood or anything else that looked suspicious. Documents obtained from the Freedom of Information Act, also called a FOIA, in spite of heavy censoring, clearly showed that Walt Disney became a special correspondent asset of the FBI. So, these are documents that can be obtained via Freedom of Information Act that have been essentially declassified. Walt Disney actually became a special paid correspondent asset for the FBI. He reported to the FBI, he reported to FBI agent E.E. E. Conroy, and in 1954, Walt was promoted to special agent in charge, which is called SAC, in the abbreviation, which means that others actually ended up reporting to him. After leaving the CIA, ex-head of CIA, William Hedgecock Webster became a lawyer for Washington, D.C.-based firm, Milback, Tweed, Havley, and McCloy. In 1993, when news broke out about Walt Disney's FBI membership, this is, actually took until 1993 for this to happen, probably because they had, didn't have the, these uh, Freedom of Information Acts available to them up until then. But at that point, news broke about Walt Disney's FBI membership. <clears throat> This ex-CIA head, Webster, who we just mentioned, worked with Disney, with the Disney family to cover up to the public that Walt Disney was an FBI agent. Webster went on TV and had inter interviews to spread the fabrication that Walt was not connected to the FBI. One of the countless items that Disney was involved in was the investigation into the disappearance and rape of a six-year-old child named Rosemary Riddle on 1-12-1961. According to documents gotten from the Freedom of Information Act, W.G. Simone was the FBI agent who met with Walt Disney in Los Angeles about the case. Simone had been one of those people who had been publicly lying by claiming that Walt Disney was never an FBI agent. The paper trail proves otherwise. Why is it so important to the FBI and the CIA to cover up what Walt, that Walt was an FBI agent? <clears throat> Walt also worked with the CIA, even through documentation, even though documentation is not available on that. The author, this author theorizes that the reason the FBI and the CIA are so touchy about letting people know about that Walt worked for the government is that the network knows how the FBI and the CIA work together to procure children for mind control programming purposes and also for to buy sexual things and pedophilia. I told you in the pedophilia thing, and hopefully we've proven that the, that the sick, sadistic, torture, rape, all this pedophilia is going on at the highest, highest, highest echelons of world government, of sometimes local government, global, you know, regional government, going on by these people. And if that's the case, do you think that means they have their tentacles in the law enforcement agencies? We also proved that in the pedophilia thing, that from, from the judges to the police chief heads, to the police. Not all of them, but, but these institutions have been infiltrated. Why? Because then they can protect their own. They preposition their own people. <clears throat> and based on everything we have read, why should any of this surprise us? Particularly if we look at the pedophilia study I did and you combine it with this thing with Disney. Actually, I'm gl really glad I did it in that order because it really does lay a foundation for a lot of the stuff we're talking about. So, again, I'll read that again. It says, uh, the reason that the FBI and CIA are so touchy about letting people know that Walt Disney worked for the government is that the network knows how the FBI and CIA work together to procure children for mind control programming purposes. Because Disney and Disneyland played such an enormous role in mind control, Disney's connection to them, although on the surface seeming a seemingly minor fact, is in reality a minor fact setting on top of an enormous, ghastly secret. See, we don't even know, none of us really know, the depths of Satan that, you know, what depravity and things that have actually are being and have been committed just through Disney alone on, on children. And yet they act as though they're the very bastion of wholesomeness and, ch and child uh, nurturing and protection. But that's how a lot of these organizations portray themselves. 
for people that didn't get involved with organizations that supposedly reach out to children are infiltrated with pedophiles and things of this nature. What better cover? You know, you, you have the Catholic priesthood, for example. Oh, you know, father so-and-so and this and that. You entrust your children to them. And in, in behind closed doors, there's been millions and millions of rapes of young boys and young girls by Catholic priest pedophiles. Proven fact, I've done a whole study on it, just key in Catholic or pedophiles, part of the word in the keyword search box. I've done a whole study on it. I have a whole file on it, exposing it, the PDF file. You know, it's, it's nothing that hasn't been proven. We have the pedophile study we can look at. You know, where people on the highest levels of government and, and things of this nature are the very ones that, are, that should be the ones locked away. They, 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 in fact, really... According to the Bible, they've really forfeited their, their right to live at all. The Bible says if you, you know, if you offend one of these little ones that believe in me, Jesus said this, we're better if a millstone were hung about your neck and you'd be cast in the midst of the sea. It would have been better for that person who had never been born. It happens all the time. The very organizations that supposedly are set in place to supposedly protect children are the ones that are there to defile them and to procure them, and to abuse them, all under this wonderful, whitewashed veneer. Look at the Franklin cover-up that I talked about in the pedophile study. You know, the whole thing with Boys Town. And they, he mentions in here the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. I'm telling you, it, it, I'm not even going to get into that. There's so much I'm leaving out of this study, because if you want to know more, just read the whole PDF that I'll put associated with this. <clears throat> so if we go further, the security forces have a headquarters room. This is in Disney uh, land, world, wherever you want to go. But they have a headquarters room where TV monitors display live the exit polls, exit points at Disney, as well as other locations. America's Most Wanted had a fairly large file on children who have been kidnapped at Disney amusement parks. Um, one mother who got separated from her child when getting off a train frantically told a guard her child was missing. The guard took her to the monitor room where they saw the kidnapper carrying the child out of the park with the boy slumped over his shoulder. In that short of time, the kidnapper had drugged the child, cut his hair, and put a different shirt on him. As written before, white slavery is part of what Disney is all about. The mother was one of the fortunate few who did manage to find their kidnapped child. An insider states that Disney police are definitely part of those moving and abusing innocent children brought in for occult rituals. In addition, Disney security forces spy on their own employees. Employees do not enter the theme parks like the visitors, nor do they move around like visitors. They have underground tunnels and underground entrances um, and facilities for that. One victim of total mind control mentioned that a tunnel entrance was at the Matterhorn Mountain at Disneyland. The Matterhorn was opened by Walt and his good friend Richard Nixon, who rode the first car down the mountain when they debuted it. The Disney Productions has given the Illuminati the cover to bring together illusionists, illusionists magicians, and special effects artists without anyone being suspicious. Some of these men were able to apply their talents toward programming children. As an example of their talents, Disney special effects artists were able to create 16 realistic-looking cadavers for the 1989 film Gross Anatomy. Um, Walt Disney has teamed up with Los Alamos and Sandia Labs, two other groups which are heavily involved in mind control, and people, and people, uh, and people control to develop body scans, branding, and access codes for the visitors to Disney's theme parks. Each of the Disney's theme parks, such as Disneyland, Disney World, Euro Disney, etc., have vast underground facilities. These underground facilities allow many of the workers to get to the ride areas via underground passages. Each theme facility also has a vast infrastructure underground to control it and to maintain it. Underground areas contain wardrobe design and repair units, fitting rooms, restrooms, cafeterias, security units, computers, freight ramps, utility encasements, and large connecting tunnels. The underground areas have programming rooms where they program these mind control slaves. 
They also have their own power plants, water systems, and their own police force. Disney Company employs 71,000 people at several locations. Now, that was at the time. Who knows what it is now? People are coming and going 24 hours a day at Disney theme parks. Three shifts keep up 24-hour business. The night crews maintain and repair the parks for thousands of people that will soon arrive in the morning. Disney makes a natural prop, a natural prop for carrying out mind control. While Disney knew everything that went on in his magic kingdom, the Epcot Center and the Disney amusement parks market all kind of occult triggers, including crystals, rainbows, wizards that reinforce programming that's actually been done in the park from, you know, these people that have been brainwashed. The Epcot Center has two glass pyramids along with its, quote, journey into imagination. Disney World has the island of Atlantis on its sub-tour. Fantasyland is one of the most used tours in Disneyland for mind control purposes. It has carousels, merry music, and an incredible castle, boat rides, storybook characters. Sleeping Beauty Castle, with its blue turrets and golden spires, is the central visual object of Disneyland. Inside Fantasyland are the Illuminati programming sites, such as the Mad Hatter's Teacups, King Arthur's Carousel Horses, and Snow White's Forest. In the far corner of Disneyland's New Orleans Square is the Haunted Mansion. The mansion is designed to frighten and scare. It is an ingenious design and many special effects and illusions. Realistic ghosts, a screeching raven, howling voices, and other scary things welcome the visitor. Life-sized holograms are created at the Haunted Mansion. A dance in sync with the music, and then they fade out at certain points, these holograms. There is a hologram of a woman's head in a crystal ball who chatters nonstop. You know, again, just pure witchcraft. Yeah. Yeah. A real good laugh for the programmers of a little child. When you're toward the end, you'll have a chance to look in the mirror where a hologram ghost will nestle up beside you. Now, I remember that. And, and at the very end of the Haunted Rise, the one up at Disney World, when you come around at the end, you're in this car, and you lo- you're looking in this mirror, and there's this ghost beside you. Literally, it looks like it's sitting there. They've got some way of projecting it into the into the thing beside you. I mean, is this pure evil? Uh, but at the time, you just didn't think a thing about it, you know? Now, it's so overt, knowing what we know, you know, <laughs> but at the time, you know, I, I had no clue. One of the Disney executives began one of the most horrible trauma-based mind, contro- mind control programming centers in Los Angeles called the Magic Castle, which was a comedy warehouse. The trauma center had horrible torture chambers. Children were brought in from South and Central America to be programmed in the Magic Castle. A brave Los Angeles policeman exposed the place, for which he lost his job, and eventually was able to get, but he was eventually able to get the site closed. God bless that guy. One of Disney's recent ventures in their Disney Institute, which Newsweek labeled the Disney of the Mind, that was in Newsweek, March 4th, 1996, page 61. This is a private, um, then it says a private club called Club 33 at Disneyland, which is located upstairs in New Orleans Square, is believed to be involved in mind control. What, like the 33rd degree Mason? 33 is a highly significant occult number to occultists. So they got their Club 33 there. The Cubs Den supervises children activities at the Wilderness Lodge Resort in Walt Disney World. So that's another place, evidently, that some bad stuff's going on. At Disney MGM Studios, the major attraction is the Twilight Zone of Terror. Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. Guests take a strange, scary trip through the hotel where guests are finally sent into an elevator that drops out of control for 13 stories. It just drops you straight down. 13 stories in a haunted hotel. Oh, it's all good. It's, it's okay. It's just good, clean fun. The ride has been advertised on TV. I mean, you know, we, we talk about the Southern Baptist people that boycotted for a time period Disney. They, they lifted the boycott. There, there's so much other reason to boycott Disney other than having gay day once a year. I, yeah, that's enough reason by far. But look at all the other stuff we've talked about. I mean, it's just unbelievable. 
It's pure wickedness. So, the, this ride that drops 13 stories has been advertised on TV. I remember seeing this advertised on TV a long time ago. The Disneyland now has, and on Halloween, they do all kind of nasty stuff. They, uh, last year, whatever, they had that Bloody Mary thing that they were doing at um, MGM, where this, you look in this mirror, and it's, you know, that, that occult thing where you look in the mirror and you do Bloody Mary, what? Oh, that was at Universal, okay. Well, they're all evil. Anyway, at Halloween, though, they all have their own occult things to draw people in. And, and, and you go, and if you do these things, you're coming out a different person. See, one of the ways that you can have demons come into you and implant into you is through trauma. Trauma. Whether that trauma is just getting unbelievably scared, whether it's defiling someone sexually, there's different kinds of trauma. And they're knowing that what they're ultimately doing is defiling the masses. Going further, Disneyland has now has a temple to the forbidden eye. The all-knowing eye of Lucifer, essentially. Which is simply a temple to the all-seeing eye, the Illuminati symbol that's on the back of our dollar bill, the capstone of the uncompleted pyramid. So this is the all-seeing eye of Lucifer or Horus. Visitors who have patience to wait in line can strap themselves in for a ride that is like a jackhammer that jars the rider through a temple filled with snakes, rats, and mummies. I know, I just need to lighten up. I, you know, this is just good, clean fun. Why don't I just, you know, stop it? Uh, I'm going to have to stop here pretty soon to go to the next part. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read one more paragraph and then stop. Years ago, this author's newsletters exposed Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, as a watering hole of the powerful elite, which included retired generals and admirals, and the site for the elite's Renaissance Weekend meat market. That's what they call it, meat market. Sounds, sounds you know, godly to me. I, you know, I'm teasing, but... Remember that at one time, Hilton Head was a private was private, and they actually imported alligators in the water around it. A person was only allowed on the island by going through security gates with clearance. In a later newsletter, Disney's Hilton Head Island Resort was mentioned. This resort was built by Disney Vacation Development, Inc., and is located on a 15-acre private island linked to Hilton Head Island by a narrow bridge. Members to the Disney Vacation Club can exchange time for vacations at Disney and other resorts around the world. Membership Memberships cost a minimum, at the time of this writing, of $9,412. Hey, where do I sign up? Only $9,412? Sounds like a great deal to me. I can get demon-possessed, and they can pilfer my wallet. What's not the like? Okay, I'm going to stop uh, this part six here, and we're going to go to part seven.